Grace and peace to you in the name of the one who creates and redeems and sustains us. Amen. Please be seated. Some years ago, I was serving at Christ Church Cathedral in Cincinnati, and I was invited to give the address at a remembrance service for the Cincinnati Bar Association. The Bar Association gathers annually in a room at the Hamilton County Courthouse to have a service of remembrance for their members who had died in the past year. I had never had a chance to speak to a room full of lawyers. Most clergy never get that opportunity. I had no idea what to say in such a circumstance. What words could celebrate life and its creator and to speak not in such purely religious tones and yet find a message that highlights the meaning of life, the fragility and blessedness of it. And so after much contemplation, I thought of this morning's text from the sixth chapter of the Hebrew book of Micah. It is a favorite of mine and maybe of yours. And seems to speak to the whole of life. The setting for this reading is a metaphorical courtroom dialogue with God. With what shall I come before the Lord? The prophet asked two and a half millennia ago. It is perhaps the best question anyone ever asked. It is, when you think about it, the question, the basic human question the fundamental human question. And people in the Bible ask it all the time. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to live? What must I do to be saved? What is expected of us? When we boil it down, what is required for us in this life? The prophet provides a list of rhetorical answers, which grows in fervor and exaggeration. Will it do to simply bow before God, a nod of the head, an occasional trip to church? Or does God want a thousand rams or 10,000 rivers of oil or our beloved child? And the answer comes so clearly. What God wants is simply to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. It could be compared to the golden rule, do unto others, or the great commandment from our gospel today, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and your neighbor as yourself. In a single, simple sentence, these brief words masterfully sum up the legal, ethical, and covenantal requirements of our relationship with God and one another. And so in our heart of hearts, it is the profound question we all ask, maybe every single day of our lives, right up to the end, to whom or to what dare I give my ultimate loyalty, my deepest love, my resources, my full and total service? If there is a God, what is required of me? How do I work to make a life and not just a living. Well, good morning to you. Welcome today on this beautiful Celebration Sunday, the day in the year when the church musters its courage, takes a deep breath, and invites a guest preacher to come right out and ask for it. <laughs> Money. It's a subject we as church people, as Episcopalians, are traditionally not so comfortable talking about. Of course, Jesus wasn't afraid to talk about money and wealth, but as Episcopalians, we notoriously are. We do it reluctantly, apologetically, but hopefully very politely. And it is also perhaps why deans and rectors frequently invite guest preachers to really talk about money. So, let me thank you for knowing what happens on this day 
and consenting to be here nonetheless. It is always an honor and a privilege to speak from this pulpit. Now, it is true, despite what you might hear or read about what it means to be a Christian, Jesus says more about money than anything else in the Bible. There are stories of seminarians taking Bibles and cutting out all the sayings about wealth and rich and poor, and ending up with a book of mostly holes, with little else to hold it together. Jesus is clear about the way that money corrupts us and contaminates us by wanting it too desperately or believing in it too much or wielding it too cruelly. 700 years before Jesus came to Jerusalem, Micah had a few words to say about that too. He begins with this summons to the people of the earth to pay attention, for God has convened a judicial proceeding. In the opening verses, a bailiff announces that God intends to bring a case against Israel and Judah. Listen to what the Lord said. Stand up, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. The mountains and the hills serve as the jury, witnessing God's faithfulness since the beginning of time. If you read this text, you might notice that the people have little defense. In fact, they don't even have an attorney to defend them. Micah says all of it just misses the point entirely. God has told you what is good. You know what the Lord requires. To do justice. To love kindness. To walk humbly with God. Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann says it this way, it doesn't take a genius to understand that religious ceremony and worship services that are not accompanied by social action, acts of love and mercy and justice are hypocritical, empty, and soon irrelevant. I learned in my ministry that when I asked new members why they decided to join our church, or why after maybe years of living on the spiritual margins, they decided to affirm their faith in Jesus Christ, the answers almost always has something to do with authenticity. What can we do? How do we live that makes a difference, a real difference? in the lives of other people, in the world. How do we love God and our neighbor? And so perhaps the most important issue on this Celebration Sunday in this cathedral is how money authentically translates into service and kindness and justice in the world. But the message today is not sell everything you own and give the money to the church. The message is not that you must empty your houses and bank accounts and everything you have worked for to be a follower of Christ. The message is asking us to look deeply at our lives and contemplate everything God has made possible and ponder, now what? Now what is God calling me to do and to be and to share? How do we ponder everything God makes possible and look for ways to accept and pass on those blessings? Yes, it is about the money, but it is about so much more. And so thinking about that, maybe it's a day to take account of the work and the spirit of this sacred place and the people who have made it to honor it as you walk around, and perhaps even to ask, how does the author of life call us to be the best that we can be? How do we contemplate what is required of us? My husband and I love trees. At one time, we lived on a street called Greenleaf, and we didn't have a backyard, only beautiful woods that grew down the hillside to a creek. But sadly, in the time we lived there, 
we cut down some 15 60-foot trees, trees lost to the ash borer beetle. It changed the landscape tremendously. But the good news, we also planted three times as many trees as we lost, pine and maple and oak and buckeye. Those in the business of trees tell you that you don't plant trees for yourself, but you plant them for those who come after you. The majestic trees we now enjoy were planted or conserved a generation or two ago, yet they provide habitat for today's wildlife and incredible beauty for us today. My friends, there has been a lot of tree planting in this place. I can say that personally. Over 20 years ago, I had the honor to serve as a deacon here, and I have so many memories. Two weeks before my ordination, we stood at the back to line up for the Christmas Eve service with a new bishop. The church was packed, and suddenly, with incense burning, the fire alarms went off. <laughs> Within minutes, half the Lexington Fire Department was lined up with us. But it was a wonderful year for me. But more importantly, my daughter was here, had been here for several years, singing in the girls' choir. And it was so much more than singing. This place provided a much needed space for her to grow, to learn, to experience something bigger than herself. The other girls in the choir, the congregation, Bruce Neswick, Jeffrey Smith, Skylar Robinson, this place, this wonderful place gave her a community, a place to be, a place to belong, a foundation beyond her family. That, my friends, is tree planting. From medieval Irish lore comes the story of an encounter between a young man on a walk and an old man struggling to plant trees beside his house. What are you doing, sir? The young man asked. And the old man replied, I'm planting fruit trees. The young man responded, but sir, you are old. You'll see no fruit from these trees in your lifetime. True, the old man answered, but the fruit I've enjoyed came from trees planted by those who came before me. I'm planting trees for those who come after me. This sacred space and the ministries here were generously planted by elders long ago, and we share in that blessing and have responsibility to generously nurture those who follow. This church, this community, is a gift. None of us here today were here to organize it or build it. None of us were here to sacrifice time and treasure to keep it going through good times and bad. We have it for a while. A little while or a long while, placed carefully in our hands to be stewards of it. And one day we will hand it to those who come after us. Tree planting, nurturing, growing, living fully, authentically, seeking justice in this community and in this city. It takes real money. Now I know there are a lot of worthy nonprofits and alma maters and causes seeking resources, but today I invite you to think about this community. How has it impacted your life, your child's life, your grandchild's life? How your resources can change the whole of people's lives, working toward justice and kindness. To the world. Oh, and if I may, I will tell you the rest of my story, 
We often say that God has a sense of humor. Well, after speaking at the remembrance service for the Cincinnati Bar Association, I was walking to my car, and the sun was shining brilliantly on the courthouse that day. I happened to look up to admire it and notice words inscribed in stone at the very top of the building. I smiled when I read it. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Dear God, we have so very much, and we hold on to it so very tightly. Open our hearts and hands this celebration morning with the promise of a love in which we are forever safe, a love we cannot earn or save or hoard, a love we can only accept and then give away. Awaken us, O oh God, and help us to live humbly with justice and generosity, the life that really is life. Amen. <laughs> 